Welcome to Arnie's Class Podcast. I'm Arnie Aniel. I'm an HR development consultant, an international public speaker, a workshop facilitator, a coach, and an educator. Life is a great opportunity, and we all learn life lessons every day. This podcast is all about those lessons. Lessons like gratitude, confidence, happiness, mindset, and a lot more. Learning without action is information. Learning with action is transformation. Join me, learn, and transform yourself into a better you. Lightmates, welcome to another episode. Another episode, another lesson. With my very special guest, I'm going to discuss and talk about conflict management. Conflicts happen in any relationship, or if I may say every relationship. It happens in organizations. And as leaders, you play a very critical and important role on how are you going to manage these conflicts in your organization. So what can you do as a leader in order... Of course, we cannot avoid conflicts because we are all different and at the same time, we are also the same. And with those similarities and dissimilarities, conflict can arise. And I believe that occasional conflicts can also help us learn, grow, and evolve, not only as individuals, but also as organizations. But what are the key steps or key actions that we can do in order to handle conflict effectively and efficiently? COVID-19 has brought changes that we never experienced before. And I'm sure things have changed. The way we work, the way we handle people are not the same. Because nowadays, we work together, yes, as a team. But at the same time, we are in different places. We use online platforms in order to connect, in order to work as a team. And with all these changes, conflicts are also different compared in what we have experienced before. Probably it's even more challenging now because we are not in the same office to discuss, to sit down and really talk about what's happening. So what can we do, especially in this situation. Lightmates, I'm sure we are going to learn a lot from my very special guest. Listen and learn. Lightmates, welcome to another episode of Arnie's Class. And in this episode, I have a very special guest. She is a corporate culture catalyst in leadership training. She is a generational family communication resource a Harvard HBS master trainer and forum facilitator. And aside from that, she's also a co-founder of Upside Coaching, a YPO certified forum facilitator, EQ certified trainer of Emotional Intelligence and Diversity Institute, and points of view master trainer. I think there are more, and we will know more about her in this episode. Please welcome Lightmates. Patience Shots. Welcome, Patience. Thank you. Honey, I'm delighted to be here. Any time spent with you is vibrant and full of information, and, and I love it. Thank you for including me, and I so appreciate the invitation. The only it's thing that you honor. didn't mention, and it might be important for this call, is that I'm also a licensed marriage family therapist. And that's an important piece because in families and in many relationships, we have conflict and we also have discourse. And so how do we manage these relationship hills and valleys? How do we get through them? So that's a little piece I'd like to just add because I think today is focused around that topic. Yes. Thank you so much for that additional information. As I said, I think there are more. <laughs> and yes, <laughs> it is like. So we're going to talk about in this episode about conflict management. It's, it's the right thing to be talking about, particularly now in this day and age. And I think it's a conversation that people avoid, or it's the big elephant globally. Is like, how do we find our path together forward rather than individually or state to state or country to country find us forward? Because it's one planet, you know? So I, I think it's a good time to be talking about conflict management. 
Yes, I totally agree. And that's why I'm going to ask you my first question, Patience. What are the common conflicts in, in organizations or in companies? It's a really good question. And I don't often get that question. When I think about conflict in organizations, it might mirror conflict outside of organizations. And often it's about um, unmet expectations or not being validated and heard and understood. That might be the common like friction point that then spills into something else. And that might be the same, whether it's in a corporate setting, in a family setting, in a marriage setting, or a friend setting. But I think often what happens is we have either unrealistic expectations, or we haven't asked for what we want, or had clarity around what it is that we truly need. And as a result, often we don't say anything. And particularly in the corporate space, we often don't share our frustration or a disappointment or some slight that we perceived. And what happens over time is those little bits of frayed edges really unravel. It would be far better to share in the moment or soon after when we're emotionally able to share our perspective about that experience, particularly with emotions. And then we would have a better chance of resolving that and managing through that conflict down the road. But what normally happens in companies is people don't say anything. They don't want to ruffle feathers. They minimize how they feel about it. And then it really balloons. They, they don't express their expectations. They don't. Or if somebody is disappointed with something, they don't share that either. They share it when they get home from the office. They'll share it with their friends, but they're not sharing it with the person who really needs to hear it. And it's even more That's difficult in Thailand, patients. I do, th- I do think it's more difficult in Asian cultures because we, in those cultures, I'm an American. So I don't live in that culture, but I've certainly traveled there, spent a lot of time there, and I've worked with companies that are based there. Um, there is an expectation that we want to help the other person um, feel less than we feel. Or we, don't want, we don't want to uh, put them in a position that they wouldn't be seen in great light. So we hold those frustrations in. But there truly are ways that we can have these conversations that are courageous, critical to help the long-term um, joy because that's so related. And at the end of the day, when we think about corporate culture, what's true is that people leave people. They don't leave companies. They leave exactly. people. And it's yes. usually yeah. around conflict management. Yeah. Well, it's actually, usually around I'm sorry, patient. Actually, I heard no, that they, yeah, they said that people join the company, but they leave because of the managers. That's the right. Leaders. And most leaders don't have these skills. And the other piece of this is conflict management is a life skill. Arnie, when did you have this class? How old were you when you took this class? Mm. Never. Exactly. We never get this class. Nobody, nobody takes this class. And to me, it's more important than any other class we could be taking because it's, we're wired to connect. Disconnect is when we're in conflict. So it goes against our biology to be disconnected from somebody. And in a group setting, it's even worse. The impact of not belonging and or being in conflict with many is worse, not only on our bodies, but we're more likely to leave those relationships if there are many that are not working well. It's that disconnect. Okay. Yeah. But yes. we never learn this. We never learn this. Yeah, even at universities or trainings, they normally don't offer this kind of training of how do you handle or how do you deal with conflicts? Mm-hmm. And really it's um, EQ because the first part of any conflict management leading to a resolution and a true clearing is how do I feel? It's self-curiosity. Because if I'm not aware how I feel or what I need, what my expectation was, what I need in the future, if I'm not able to articulate that, it's going to be very difficult for myself and someone else to resolve something or manage through it if they aren't aware of how I feel. 
So that first piece, that first important phase of the learning that we don't get um, is really EQ. How do I feel? What do I need? Where am I hurt? Where, you know, it's, it's all of that. And, and a lot of that is also connected to what was the conflict resolution or management style in my family of origin? What did I observe about conflict? Did people avoid it? Did people come in with anger all the time? Could I express any emotions? You know, how, what did I learn and discover? What did my body experience as a result in my childhood? And what does my culture tell me? And then I get into adulthood and what's the skill set? You know, it's very low globally, regardless of culture. And we can look at all of human conflict. And always it really goes back to this core piece about EQ. Emotional intelligence. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. And a lot of people are actually, they are not even literate enough to label what kind of emotions they're experiencing in certain situations. And I think without without that literacy, I don't think they can really truly express that emotions with other people. It's true. And the language is the soma, the body. What is my body saying and if I'm not able to interpret or speak my body's language, then it's going to be very difficult for me to communicate that to someone else. I mean, our bodies communicate anyway. You, you can be in a conversation with anyone and you have a sense of what's happening or you feel it in your own body. That's what mirror neurons do. If you're angry and I'm very close physically to you, my body will start going into fear or have an anger response because my own neurons will start firing and, and to match yours. But it's also true that most people don't understand that there's a difference between emotions and feelings. Yes. So if we're talking yeah. about EQ, we really have to pull back even further. Like, what it, It's not even about what I'm feeling. It's what, what are the emotions that are occurring? Because emotions are neuropeptides and adrenaline, cortisol, hormones. There are bodies way of constantly caretaking, putting us really in alert. Our vagus nerve is constantly scanning for danger. And as a result, our chemicals are constantly flooding us. It's when we feel it, when we feel that sweaty palms or sweat or, you know, our stomach tenses or feels a little nervous, the butterflies, we're actually feeling the chemical. Yeah. Then we it's label working. it a feeling. We lay, I'm scared. You know, even if you think of tears, it's our body's overwhelming chemistry that's getting flooded out of us. You know, like this, we sweat here, but we cry through those tear ducts. They're chemicals. And then we say, oh, I'm sad because there's tears. But really, it's helping people understand this EQ pieces. How, what, what's going on in my body? Let me move inward and self-assess. Then I can language, connect to what's going on for me, and then I can move to the conversation, which is the, other, the next phase of EQ is other focus. It's self, then other. How is this other person feeling? What do they need? What are their expectations? What might they be disappointed around, et cetera? And then it's having a conversation. But it really starts with the self. But we don't learn this as humans. Then we put people in giant corporations and we just hope it all works out. And it usually does not. And, it really doesn't. Yeah. And I think a lot of leaders out there or a lot of people out there are, they, they have this misconception about what is emotional intelligence? They always think of, oh, that's emotions. You know, don't be emotional. That's feeling. We don't need that, especially in managing people, which I don't understand why. I think that most people are afraid of anything that's different. So when I come to a conversation or a behavior, I get curious. What could they be feeling that's driving behavior? Because it always starts with emotions. That's right. So if somebody says, oh, you shouldn't talk about feelings or we, there's no room for feelings. It's telling me a little bit about their understanding of them or their fear about them. I know Simon Sinek, uh, a well-known um, speaker, you know, a great corporate co uh, consultant. He has said the value of emotions come from sharing them, not just having them. That's and nice. that's a leadership coach. You know, it's, it's we know we know that great leaders are emotional because they're human and exactly. it doesn't mean spilling regrets and crying at every board meeting that's not it 
But it is okay and it's appropriate for a leader to say, I'm a little disappointed with some of our numbers this quarter. My expectation is that they were higher, right? That to me is a high EQ leader. The other piece to that leadership then is, and I'm hopeful and excited that we can, you know, get the numbers on the next quarter. We've got a great team. You know, you, you hear the leader inspire others. But if the leader is not sharing any of the feelings verbally so that people can hear it and see it, I think there's a disconnect. I see. And, you know, if you're in a board meeting and someone is clearly not happy with the numbers and they haven't told you they're angry, clearly you know they're angry because you feel it and you see it. But the EQ, the high EQ leader will say it. I'm really disappointed. I'd hope for this. So or can we say, where are we stuck? Go ahead, Arnie. Yeah. So patients, can we say that leaders who are effective leaders are the people who actually express their emotions? It's not that they just keep it inside them, but they actually express it. So people will know and understand. And because if they keep it in themselves, I, I don't think that that's emotional intelligence. Can, can we it say like that? But it also, it, it's not emotionally intelligent if you keep it inside and don't communicate. The worst possible leader has a disconnect between what they say and how their body's communicating. Well, you know, we think about psychological safety. Google hired, um, this was a couple of years ago, Google hired consultants. They spent a year assessing the culture of Google. And it turns out, what was the problem with the high turnover and all of the cultural challenges? It, it was psychological safety, which really means your actions need to match your words, which needs to match my experience of you. Because if, for example, if a manager is saying, I'm not angry, that disconnect puts me in a state of fear because my vagus nerve is reading one message, but my ear is hearing another. So I'm not safe. And that's a critical learning. It really is a critical learning. And psychological safety is true, whether it's a family, a firm, friendships, right? They're all, they're all relationship driven. So the content is so similar, but it starts with that patients there's a lot of information here and i'm really excited to to continue but let me just because of our listeners life mates so in conflict management the very first thing that is very important is emotional intelligence and it starts with yourself yes i see here and if i wanted to give a broad stroke to some of the proven and research back like we irrefutable research we know what can truly heal um, conflict or, you know, what are the steps in conflict management? If we even pull back a little further, that EQ, that first phase, it's how do I feel? But even more, who are you to me? Arnie, you're my friend. I care about you. Um, Jolene, you're my boss. Um, Violet, you know, you, you're my coworker. Um, you know, we can just go down the list of, people in our lives, if we start the conflict management conversation with telling somebody well, who they are to us, what we're really doing is helping their ver vagus nerve stay calm and neutral so that they can actually hear what we have to say and have their mirror neurons fire. Because if our listener does not feel what we feel, that's called empathy. If they don't feel what we feel, we have a very low chance of navigating this. So it really, if we pull back even further, this EQ piece is, who are you to me that I would want to have this conversation? And then I share how I feel. That's really the true progression of how we navigate and you know, the steps to get there. I care about you. You matter to me. And I feel disappointed, discouraged, um, angry, hurt. You know, then we go to the feeling. I see. So we have to clarify first, who is this person to me? I have a follow-up question on that. Patients, what if you are my boss, but I don't care? What if this, they are in that kind of relationship that, yes? Yeah, to me, it's already unsafe because that don't care means that my body has moved to contempt. And contempt is the closest thing to dehumanizing someone. And then really, it's going to be very difficult to resolve that conflict. It would be far better to pull back a little more and ask, what has happened that you don't care? 
What, what, what hurt has come? When you reflect back or really bridge back and turn toward those experiences with that person that you don't care about, what happened along the way that perhaps you didn't communicate or how are you feeling that in hindsight you might have said? Because most relationships start out hopeful and you did care. But That's there was right. a moment when it shifted to I don't care. Something happened in there. And relationships are two people. They're two people. So if I'm hurting, I'm part of this. I'm part of the problem and I'm also part of the solution. But I have a part to play. I'm not fully a victim because if I said nothing, then I'm part of it. So if I don't care, to me, it's still about me. Can it still be resolved, uh, patients, in your experience? Yeah, 100%. If both people have a desire, if both, both partners believe that there's value in resolving and managing through, 100%. If you, I have been in rooms with people screaming or who've been wronged in ways incredibly painful. And we find, we find those edges, we, we work through them, we allow both partners to speak, to be echoed and mirrored, and we get to the future-focused conversation, not let's stay in the past of what each of us did or didn't do. Move on, but what do we right? Agree let's on? move on well, to what the future. We agree on? Yeah, we, we can move on to the future, but in order to move on, my body and my heart and soul need to know that you understand how I feel. Not that you agree with me. That's not critical. But I actually have to understand and be heard and validated that my perspective is accurate for me. Not that you agree, but it's for me. That will help me then move forward. But if I have a listener who constantly is saying, no, that's not accurate. No, that's not how it happened. Right? I think that is unresolvable. But if I have a listener that says, you know, I can see how you'd feel sad about that. From your perspective, I can understand how that would have hurt or disappointed you. Now, all of a sudden, my body is shifting and softening because somebody's validating my experience. Yes. Patients, you mentioned that if the two people, they have the desire, what if only one has the desire to resolve the conflict, but the other partner or the other party is not willing to resolve? So what can we do with this situation? In that situation, while heartbreaking, and likely not resolvable, the person who's struggling most can take steps to self-soothe, to, to really uh, get themselves in a better place of feeling more joy. Because when we're not, when we're not managing conflict, we're in a, in a, a groove, like I call them neural, neural ruts. Like we just stay in the gully, in the ditch with that negativity and that pain until we take ownership for our part in keeping those ruts going and then release the person, find positive about that person, uh, journal about, write a letter that you don't send. You know, there's got to be something that you do to help you navigate how you feel, even if that person does not want to manage that conflict. I've experienced, I have this personal experience patients in one of the organizations I've worked with before. There's one very senior leader in the organization and she didn't really listen. She's always like on the negative aspect of everything. I'm not exaggerating, but this is the, the real thing that happened when I was there. Everything is wrong for her. Everything should be only from her. If it's her idea, it's right. If it's other ideas, it's wrong. How can we sounds handle like this kind hurting. of thing? She sounds like she's hurting. Because emotions drive behavior. Her behavior, if we don't judge the behavior, we come with a neutral lens. What is her behavior telling us? What is it communicating? And if we go a couple steps back, how might she be feeling that she's behaving in that way? What you described sounds like she's truly hurting. Maybe in her childhood, she didn't have the right to make decisions. Decisions were made for her, or maybe there were very, you know, controlling um, places that she lived in. I'm not sure. I who knows? But what you've described is someone that's in pain. You know, we have a choice to stay or go in the corporate space. I don't have to stay 
and navigate and manage that conflict, I can leave. But if I really like this job and, and there's a lot of value, then it's worth my while to try and see if I can get there. But it's going to come from empathy, not disdain for the person. So it really is, okay, what could be happening that this person is, you know, coming into this relationship with this desire for power and, or, you know, authoritative Instead yes. of, you know, I think that's the word. Communal, yeah. Um, when I think about people who are authoritative, I, I just think about wounded, hurting people. And, and pain patterns are developed over time. You know, hurt people hurt people. I like that. Can so you I, say that again? I, I yes. Think. Hurt people hurt people. And they're pain patterns. And they come from long before our conscious mind is happening. So I don't know what her story is or her ancestral story or what happened to her. Maybe she had a lovely childhood, but then in her first job, she was berated and, um, and that job meant something to her. And maybe that boss was very unkind or wronged her in some way. And she wasn't able to resolve it internally. Maybe she then took that same behavior. She went from victim to the perpetrator. And then she became the perpetrator of that same behavior that hurt her which is in essence, keeping her safe from feeling the pain. But that's someone who's hurting. So if we can come from a place of compassion, we have a better chance of getting past the conflict. So she's protecting herself by hurting other people. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. That's painful. Patience, it's like I still have like a lot of questions in my head now, but I, I really like this conversation. So we started with emotional intelligence in conflict management. And then you mentioned this, that what, what people actually experience in the past is actually being manifested now in the present. So it's very important to really know themselves. So aside from emotional intelligence, what's next, patients, in conflict management? What's next would be um, follow-up. You know, coming to this conversation with candor, uh, what do we agree on, right? So maybe both of us hurt, but we can agree on that. Both of us feel wounded and, and disparaged. Both of us um, are disappointed or, or et cetera. You know, if you can find how we are similar rather than dissimilar, again, we have a better chance of navigating that conflict. If you look back through human history and we think about breaking bread, In the United States, we have Thanksgiving. It's sharing a meal with people that we had wronged, you know, the first first people, the first nations, people who were clearly on this land. And there was a conversation about, well, what do we agree on? We agree that we both need this land. And so we're going to share a meal and and move past the the discourse and the war. And we're going to look ahead to let's share the land because we agree that we both need it. And so this, we think about human history, how do we navigate any conflict? You can look at wars, yes. you know, Japan and China or World War I, World War II. What was once our enemies is now our friend. That's right. You know, Egypt and Israel. And right now it's beautiful to see in the news that there are conversations happening with countries in the Middle East and Israel, opening borders, opening arms, breaking bread, looking past what was and looking ahead to what will be. What do we agree on? What's our shared desire in the future? That's a critical part of that. And that's EQ about me, EQ about you, and then co-creating a new outcome, that one that we hadn't anticipated. Because if we think about most conflict, people come at it with, I get my way and you don't. Yes, that's that's right. That's that's not... (laughs) That's not management and it's not resolution, right? Um, We also don't want people to fold. If you think of a bully, we don't want to resolve conflict or, or, you know, navigate conflict by having someone just fold completely. Okay, you can have whatever you want. That's not okay either. It really is this co-created outcome that's different than anything that either of us could have understood at the beginning of the conversation. But there's a critical question around this process. When you get to the, what do we agree on? Then the question also is, is there more? Is there anything else? Because in most relationships, there is. Oh, actually, yeah. Remember, we, we're having this conversation about, 
uh, you responded um, to my email in this way. But remember two months ago or two years ago, this thing happened. I didn't say anything, but actually it's still hurting still inside. Still there. Still in there. So is there more? That's an important piece. It comes from Imago theory. Is there more? Is there anything else? Let me make sure I understand you fully. That's the final piece. I'm going to mirror and reflect and echo what I heard you say, not what I think, not what I want, not what I interpret about what you've said. I'm going to echo back like a, a true echo. Arnie, let me make sure I heard you. You said that I'm a friend of you. You care about me and you feel disappointed because I didn't get that report to you when you wanted it. And the impact is you're not sure that you can trust me. You know, my part is I should have said something before that the deadline was so tight, but I didn't want to disappoint you. So I didn't say anything, um, you know, but here we are. I want to make sure I understand you, but you've said all these things. Did I get it accurately? Did I miss anything? Is there anything else that's keeping our heart our space, you know, separate? You wouldn't say that in a workplace, but, you know, that's really the, the question. The deeper question, is there anything that's keeping our physical bodies disconnected? And is there anything else? Did I get everything? Did I understand you correctly? Now it's my turn to share how I, my perspective, how I see our relationship, how I feel, what I want and need, et cetera. And then you echo and mirror me back. That's Not right. what you think. It's just truly an echo. Because what's also true, what resolves conflict and, and really softens the edges is when we are seen, heard, and validated. And it's true across the globe. Totally agree. Totally agree. Maybe, maybe I don't even change my behavior. But if I've communicated to you in an empathic way that, yeah, you said you're really hurt and disappointed. Is that how you're feeling? When you say, yeah, already your body's chemically going to correspond with a little dopamine because I validated you. I didn't yes. say I agree or not. But I received that message of yours and I validated its accuracy. Critical. It's critical. We can look at research from the late 80s, you know, early 80s. Um, there's a very well-known experiment called the still face. And it really is true that when we do not mirror another human, very quickly our body goes into an agitated state. And we swing very high and very low to hyper and hypoarousal. So very quickly, if you come in and you're, you're um, you know, let's say we're just having a conversation and all of a sudden you look away while I'm speaking. You look away, uh, your body starts to pull back, and even worse, you have no reaction. What harm occurs, occurs quickly. Yes. Lasting. Because our body's responding to that incredible fear of annihilation and abandonment. So it's really important to hear, see, validate, even if you don't agree. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't think you you have to agree all the time. It's I think just like what you said, validation. And it's very important that you feel that someone listened to you. I think listening skill is one of the key critical skills that we never learn. We have reading yeah. exercise. <laughs> we have writing yeah, exercises. Right. Yeah, you brought up a really good point. In 2016, 2015, there was some research um, done. And the question was, of all the things a friend can do to help you feel better, and there was a whole long list of them, what's the most important thing that when you think about times when you've been hurting or you really needed that friend, what did they do? The summary was they simply listened. That's wow. it. But it's the way they listened, not rushing in to share their own pain, not rushing in with advice, which never works anyway. Exactly. They simply, they simply listened. I hear you. You're hurting. You're disappointed. Yeah. You know, it's that. It's that human Mirror, that's what resolves and we can manage through the conflict. We don't have to agree. Very well said, patients. Uh -huh. But with your experience working with big, small, medium organizations, what do normally leaders do in conflict management What that you think that they should stop? Stop this. Change. <laughs> Never do this again. It's not okay. working. So, 
are you giving me my magic wand? Is that what you, I can swing it around? <laughs> what do I want you to change? Oh, the little genie lamp. I'm going to, yes. I'm going to touch that. Um, what I really think is that most leaders in the corporate space just hope it all works out. Hope it gets better. But what happens is when more time passes, it gets worse. It's just a little inch and a little inch and a little inch. It doesn't get better unless there's a conversation because maybe the leader hasn't noticed that there's something changed, but within the person that where there's conflict, something has changed. Yes. So I think, you know, if I had a magic wand, what would I want them to stop doing? I want them to stop hoping it gets better and come head in on, Oh, you know what? This, I always have this at my desk. It's a little elephant. <laughs> nice. Because, because Let's talk about the elephant in the room. And exactly. it's wow, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I have a really lovely exercise around um, grace and elephants. You know, where do we give grace? Where, where do we need grace given? But also, what's the elephant in the room around conflict? And, you know, what do I want leaders to start doing? Talking about the elephant in the room head on from a place of compassion. And those sentences start like this. I'm curious, or I wonder, is anyone feeling this way? I'm curious if someone's disappointed. I'm wondering if, right? That's how we can talk about the elephant in the room. We don't have to name it and shame it. We just acknowledge from a place of curiosity, what's happening, right? So that to me would be a high EQ leader, start doing this, Name the elephant, is, you know, and maybe it's anger, disappointment, fear, whatever it is. Is anyone feeling fear or disappointment, right? Name it. I want them to start naming it and, and stop hoping that it'll just get better on its own because it doesn't. I and that behavior, that. if that behavior is occurring in the office, it's occurring at their home, and it's also occurring in their other relationships in the community because people are the same across environments. So if you're exactly. not camping here, you're not doing it over here either. I see. I love that idea of the elephant. I love that. I'll start doing that and carry my own elephant. <laughs> In my briefcase, which is next to me, I have little gray ones. And um, if people take the risk and are vulnerable and navigate and manage conflict live in a group setting when, it, when they're most at risk, I always give them a little elephant to acknowledge the incredible and beautiful risk they took. And, and the, you know, people are like, I want an elephant. I want one. So, okay, let's do this. You know, let's look around because what drives intimacy, what drives safety, psychological safety is when you resolve, that's what drive uh, resolves. I mean, that's what drives safety and trust is resolution yes. of the conflict. Right. So that's about the part of the leader's patience. How about what do you think employees or the staff should stop doing or should start doing in conflict management? Okay. What I would love, because I've got my magic wand out again, <laughs> is if um, there was, you know, let's say it's just five. I, in my feeling sheets, I think I have 50. I'm all broken down by um, Ekman's uh, research. But wouldn't it be great if we could just walk up to a cubicle and we can do this on Zoom as well? But let's say we're back in the office and I can walk up to a cubicle and outside that cubicle, the person sitting there has like done like a little flip chart of one to five, you know, and maybe it's a happy face, a curious face, you know, a sad face. Because what I, what's going to happen is I'm going to understand before I even engage with that person what's happening emotionally for them. It will change how I then come into that conversation. So, you know, is there a way to bring that in that would be at the corporate culture level? Like, can this, can this be scaled 100%? Um, lots of uh, places uh, that I've worked with, we do this. So we can quickly, you know, just very quickly see what's happening for someone. So what would I like to start them, have them start doing? Sharing how they feel, which is counterintuitive. Most people say, oh, we can't talk about emotions at the office. It's not true because your body's talking about emotions for the entire time you're there. And everybody knows it because everybody's feeling what you feel because they can read it. You can walk into a management meeting. You can walk into the lunchroom. You can walk in any company 
And very quickly, you know what, <laughs> who's feeling what. Yes, yes, exactly. And you can <laughs> not just feel it, but see it. Some people, they have their body language. <laughs> yeah, I can walk into the coffee room. Oh, very quickly, I know how people are feeling. So it's just giving the tools to put it outside. We're already having conversations about how we feel through our bodies. Let's just put the word there, right? So I'd love it if employees could say, I'm really excited, you know, and I'm showing the gratitude. I'm really thankful that this uh, task was completed on time. That means a lot to me. Thank you. You know, and here's the impact of that on time. It allowed me to focus on something else. So it's sharing the feelings, gratitude, joy, and also the disappointment. You know, I'm disappointed. I thought we were going to meet today. I thought we were going to have lunch and we didn't. You know, I'm disappointed. I think it still goes back to the same life tools. All the tools are in that toolkit and they all start with how do I feel and communicating that outward. So that's my wish for employees, even in companies. It's the same because we're humans doing a job, but we're humans first. Yes, that's right. That's right. I totally agree and beautifully said patience, of course. But you mentioned there's one word that you mentioned that actually I really want to discuss more, but just in a brief, the psychological safety. I think nowadays it's very important that people really feel, I think even before, but nowadays, especially during this COVID time of working, especially hybrid teams, how can leaders have that, uh, like, how can leaders make all their employees or their team members to have that kind of feeling that, yes, I'm psychologically safe to work here? Um, if they're truly committed to having psychologically safe companies, which at the end of the day will improve productivity and outcomes, all, all proven, it's important to understand these critical elements that drive psychological safety. When let's say I'm the employee, I need to be able to interpret the hostility of everyone around me. So it goes back to, I'm not mad. It can't be that. It has to be an accurate, um, it can't be a mixed message. It has to be congruent. We call it psychologically congruent. Um, I am angry and I express my anger and my body is aligned with that. So I, so I need to be able to interpret hostility. Um, I need to know how you see me. Do you see me as productive? Do you see me as valuable? Do you experience me as worthy to be working here? So I need to have a sense of that. Sometimes that's nonverbal and sometimes it's verbal coming through uh, evaluations or other comments that come, you know, in the normal course of working together. Um, what else drives psychological safety? Safety. I need to be able to tell you how I experience you. I need to know how you experience me, but I need to be able to say, here's how I experience you. Um, I need to be able to share what I want and need and expect. I need to be able to hear the same from you when it's safe to disagree. If companies say, oh, we never have conflict. Well, that's not true because it's not normal to be in a healthy relationship and never have conflict. That's not normal. It's not normal. What's normal is for occasional conflict to emerge. It's how we manage it. And we need to be able to have protocols in place and processes to manage it. That's what also drives psychological safety. We need to be able to disagree. We need to be able to make choices. I need to have a say in my outcome. We know from the millennials now that they want to have jobs, that they see the outcome to their work. They want to have that's, impact. That's they want right. impact, right? So that's a piece of that. I need to be able to make mistakes and learn and practice. If the expectation is 100% all the time, that's unrealistic and not safe for me. I'm too nervous to relax. And we really need to have the sensation of belonging. And that means I'm safe emotionally, I'm safe physically, I'm safe mentally and safe spiritually. I belong here, I belong here, right? That's psychological safety, and it's critical for culture. It really is. I mean, you can think back to Microsoft in the late 80s, and that's sorry, late um, 90s. 90s and, yeah, 90s and 2000. I mean, it was really bad. Autocratic, not safe. You couldn't make mistakes. People were fired left and right. It wasn't safe. Oh, well, they got fired. I feel fear. I'm, I might get fired. We don't know what we did. 
right? So I don't, I don't know what, how they see me. It's not safe, right? Toxic, really toxic. Oh my. Maybe yeah. in some changes, but that's psychological safety. It really is. And we're also kidding ourselves if we believe that we cannot have an interpersonal relationship in the office. I don't mean sexual. That has nothing to do with it. But I need to be able to say to you, I had a great weekend. I saw this movie or I went out yeah. to this restaurant. You know, some I think we've swung in some ways. So I can't talk about anything in my personal life. That's not normal either. It's normal to say, hey, what'd you do this weekend? How are your holidays? That's right. You just That's right. Until midnight, you know, did you ring in the new year or were you in bed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. This is interpersonal and we need to have those conversations too because they matter as well. Yes. Do you get me? Yes. Yeah, do I belong yeah. here? Yeah, that's right. That's very important. Yeah. We're almost towards the end, patients, but there, there is one question that I really wanted to address, which is because most of the time you're you're sharing like people should be able to express, to share, to communicate what's inside. How will you encourage people who are let's say introvert or people who are not really communicative, they, they are not expressive. How will you encourage these people to please express what's inside? Say it, verbalize it, tell it, say it. So how will you encourage these people? Mm -hmm. I just want to comment first on your deep desire to have people have that skill. I heard it. I could see the emphatic desire of you to just what is that thing they can do? Because you recognize it's a, a value to them. And I can see that you care deeply. Um, what can they do? If I'm an introvert, I still have feelings the same as an extrovert. That's How right. I might express them uh, will look differently. Right? An extrovert might be more comfortable, um, but the tools that we can, that, you know, the tools are the same, but my tool might look, have a different color, Right. Uh, maybe I have a really big uh, baton and, and a megaphone because I'm an extrovert. But the introvert, maybe it's subtle and it might look like this. <sighs> I love working here, but it's, you know, it's hard for me to have this conversation. Uh, I, I was, mm, how could, I, I'm really disappointed because I was hoping I got that raise. Let me revisit that. Right. So how I say it, well, I'll get there, but it might feel... Um, more reserved or intimidated, or it even might be super subtle. Maybe my body will communicate it more than my words, and it's going to come through a lack of eye contact. Maybe my body's really struggling because I'm uncomfortable, right? So if I'm the boss, I want to receive people however they are, whether they're an extrovert or an introvert, and pay attention to the subtle, tune into the subtle nuances. And then what will bring that uh, introvert out is praise. I'm so glad you told me. Thank you. This means a lot that you've just communicated this to me, right? So if I'm an introvert and I get positive reinforcement, I'm more likely to try that again. Now I had, I just had one neural pathway that fired and wired, you know, wired and fired together. Uh, it was positive. That'll give me a little confidence to do that again, right? There's lots of tools, you know, we can self-navigate our stress level because a lot of times introverts get flooded with yes. emotions. So, you know, we can do the four breath, you know, in for four, yeah. out for four. Another little tool, um, and I'll just back up so you can see a little bit. If I work with uh, employees who, who need some more tools to navigate and manage conflict, um, it's moving uh, across your body. So it's, you know, taking my right hand and putting it on my left leg. Now it's a subtle thing change where maybe we're across the desk i'm talking to my boss but i've done something that helps my body stay grounded and that's moving uh across the meridian and then maybe i can do that with the other one nobody would need to know i can cross my legs underneath the table so i'm navigating my introvert emotions um, but i'm doing something with my body that's helping right uh research from amy cuddy out of harvard i can raise my hands before i have that conversation I actually flood my body with serotonin. Yeah, yeah. And this conversation is going to be great, right? I'm already priming my emotional state. I can tap during the conversation yes. here. You know, we can tap and that'll allow us to stay present in our body. If I'm an introvert, that might help me a little bit as I have these courageous conversations. But at the end of the day, be yourself. 
because that's really what people feel in you and that ha- allows people to receive you but i but i agree that the introvert extrovert thing is an important one because lots of times you think about classrooms or um from childhood or a, even in a corporation some employees stand out more yes because they're extroverts they raise their hand they they all go get that food delivered i'll bring you know donuts for everyone but i think some of the responsibility lies with management let me notice who who's not you know saying anything but they're highly skilled adds so much value because we don't want to miss those people either we don't you know everybody has purpose like a beehive everybody has a role everybody's critical to the task and and you know a lot a lot of times um the myers briggs in some corporate spaces people use that to hire that's to me really outdated what we understand about neuroscience because maybe i'm an introvert and i'm not a likely candidate for that sales position however i'm very compassionate very very you know emotional but i'm an introvert maybe there are clients out there that want to do business with me because they trust me they yes. might not trust that extrovert who's on the dance floor and very loud know, very <laughs> loud but my introvert employee who maybe somebody else wouldn't hire for a sales position actually is the right person for this position because they create incredible trust and safety in the relationship that they're having with my clients just things to think about yes wow thank you for sharing that patients they said there is conflict because most of the conflicts are actually from the management that's why it's called conflict management <laughs> do you agree <laughs> nope i don't i think it goes back to when did anyone take this class it can be from the employees it can be from what, what, whatever level in the organization we can we can stay focused looking back this is how it's been or we can take ownership for the future how do we want this to be how can we co-create a wonderful new different future where both of us take responsibility for our 50% because in a relationship it is it's 50% that's right and i can be in conflict with myself it has nothing to do with anyone right so i i do think it isn't anyone's um not responsibility but it's not anybody's fault it's not anybody's fault i have compassion for humans across the globe that we just didn't get these tools slowly and surely things are shifting because we see how high eq leaders are driving change from the top down we know that's happening globally it's not enough tools at the same time you know but we're getting there i feel hopeful and i'm optimistic because i see it people want it uh, just yesterday uh, i'm working with a huge company here in los angeles um they are uh, expert witnesses for attorneys all phd's and they have said to me for months no emotions attorneys that we're working for you this is you know this is the legal system i said yes but you're working in a in a company that you have emotions we've been now months working on this i got an email yesterday from the owner of this massive company and he said he understands now how he has missed opportunities because he has not let emotions come into the company so that you know people are open people are open to change i know they are because they want change that's right i know yes. yeah as i hear you and listen to you patients conflict management is actually based on the relationship that people have if there are three things that you can actually advise or suggest or recommend to make the relationships better what are those three things this question you're asking <laughs> questions are you asking questions first and foremost find something positive notice notice what is working however slight notice that and say it out loud what do you see that is nice and well rather than with my you know binoculars what's not working um so that would be one take ownership for the outcome you're not a victim okay right that would be another and then that's a shift a mind shift 
about how do I perceive this re- relationship and that conflict. Yes. Um, you, you have tools, you have ways to navigate, you know. Um, it, there is a boat you can build and you can row it, right? Um, and then third might be maybe forgive people for not having had what they need. Right. And, and maybe even self-compassion, maybe forgive yourself as well. You know, if you think about your own life, have there ever been a moment or has there ever been a time and an experience that you regret something you said or did? Yeah, probably because we're human. So can you take that same thinking and put it out there? Right. How might, how might I have done something in the past that, I might need to ask for forgiveness. You know, sometimes when I work with a corporate space, I ask this question, is there anyone left that you need to forgive? Or, and more importantly, is there anyone that needs to forgive you? Nice. Wow. So then we can, we can manage some conflict together, but now we can do that because it opens and expands what I understand about my role in any relationship. Because I'm not perfect and neither is the person that I'm in conflict with. Yes. So three things there to improve your relationship. Find what is positive. Take ownership of the outcome and forgive. Forgive yourself and forgive others. (laughs) We're almost at the end, patience. But I have standard questions I always ask my guests. First, what with all your experiences, both personal and professional, what do you think is the greatest lesson you've learned? I looked down just now so I could tell that I'm feeling emotional. Right? That's my body communicating to me. I did. I ooh, And I felt my body slow down. Um, why does conflict management mean so much to me? Because my own family of origin did not navigate conflict. And my mother was married five times never could navigate conflict. And when I was 23, I'm now 56. When I was 23, I shared with my mother for the first time that I was angry and she never spoke to me again. So I, my biggest lesson and my true knowing is that anybody is forgivable because I forgive her. She did not have the tools. She was hurting um, you know, my biggest lesson is everybody can heal. If I've let go of any anger and pain from my mother, anybody can do anything. And at the end of the day, she was doing the best she can with the tools she had, you know? So what's my, what's my big lesson? We're human, being human. And, you know, it might not be today that we manage this conflict, but it could be tomorrow. So I stay hopeful. And I just know we can navigate this. I know we can I've seen it. I've seen people come together. Um, we think about reconciliation in South Africa. And there's a whole history of people who forgave their captors, Nelson Mandela, people who have forgiven, the people who have killed their children. They've been truly forgiven them, yes. right? We, are, you know, my big lesson is we can, we can navigate conflict and manage it. We really can if we want to. Nice. And the follow-up on that is, what decision you've made in the past and still has an impact of who you are or what you are at the moment? Ooh, let me think about that. Um, <laughs> a decision I made. Well, I made a decision to go into therapy, like my, get my own therapy when I was in undergrad, uh, college. That that decision impacted my life it changed the trajectory of the trajectory of my life because I was going to be an attorney that was my big dream but then I started in therapy and two three years in really shifted everything and I think that decision has served me well in my career but also with me in, in relationships to have been on the other side of the chair I've been I've been on both sides of the yes. chair that, that's a great decision that positively impacted me and it still impacts me today nice yes i think your life is a wonderful and 
full of colors and everything in there. If you are going to write or someone else is going to write your, your life as a book, Patience, what will be the title and what kind of book will it be? I already know because I'm working on a memoir. Oh, the wow. Title, the title tentatively is Hope for Patience. Oh, nice. Yeah, because I do think there's hope. It propels me every day. I wake up hopeful every single day. And I have a lot of reasons that maybe other people would have experienced my life to say, oh, I don't know. But I wake up full of hope. And I want other people to have that same belief because I've seen firsthand how we can evolve and grow and thrive in relationship. Because that's what we're meant to do. We're, you know, I said earlier, we're wired to connect. Failure to thrive is a real thing. We cannot thrive without others. So I'm hopeful that we can do this together. I'm really hopeful every day. And I believe in people. I believe we can do it across the globe as one community globally, but also in our own communities and in our own families and our own companies. I, I just know it. I know it. And I'm, you're here I'm with moment. you with that. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know, you must believe it too because you've hired me to not hire me. You know, you invited me to come and speak. So there's a part of you that feels very hopeful. Yes, I know that. Yes. I, yeah. That's why I'm inviting people like you who can inspire other people because I believe that together we can do more. We can. Yes, we are. People are. You know, the news can be filtered to positive news. A lot of my Instagram is positive. There's so much good happening in the world. There's so much good happening. You just need to look for it. Yes. And focus on the positive, not on the negative. That's right. What's working well? What can we celebrate? That's right. That's where we want to wear our hat and where we want to look. And when can we expect that book to be published, Patience? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. That's a task that's been sitting for some time. I've done a lot of, of the heavy lifting, but it's putting it all together. Yeah. So if you've got a great ghostwriter, that's really where I am now looking for someone. <laughs> <laughs> I have the story to tell, not the skills to do the writing, but I know that person's out there. I'm going to, I'm hoping you'll find me. Yeah. Actually, I was able to write one book about public speaking patients. Yes, it's been published. Oh, right. I that. Yes. I yeah, that. I, I'm, I'm thinking of another book, but just like you, because that one is like more of a journal, a book like a journal. But writing, writing a book, I have a lot of ideas, but I'm, I also want someone to write it for me. I, I tell you that person. Honey, I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> but you're, you're a creator. I know you, you know, we're friends. So I know the amount of um, output that you have. You're a huge lifelong learner. That learning comes in and then it flows out of you in the work that you do and in the myriad of areas that you're working. So, you know, you, you're a creator for sure. And maybe someone else can distill it down into the book, but you're, you know, you're effervescent with information. You really are. Yeah, We both are. <laughs> I can feel your positivity. Well, hopefully your listeners will feel inspired today. Your life mates. I'm inspired, so I'm sure my life mates will be inspired. I am sure of that, and they can learn a lot from this episode. So, patience, one last. If there's one message that you can share, especially to the younger generation, what will it be? Especially when it comes to relationships or conflict. I was going to say one love. Let me say one love. Um, step into someone else's shoes. Step into someone else's shoes. That might be it. Wow. I was at first going to say, get a passport and travel the world because that's, <laughs> how, that's how we step into somebody else's shoes. Right? That's I right. Want to that's right. How you live your life, which is different than how I do, you know, but during COVID, it's not really easy yeah. to say, <laughs> go travel. That's not going to happen. Uh, but I do think stepping into somebody else's shoes is, is an important piece of this. It is. I see. Wow. Short. There's a very concise, very clear message there. Step in someone else's shoes. Thank you so much, Patience, for being my guest. I love you and I miss you so much. I hope that we, we meet again 
soon and this COVID, I just hope that it will allow us to meet again. It's been a long time. It has, and, and I can reflect back on when we did meet, which was in Thailand. You didn't have a podcast. You didn't have this global audience. And because of COVID, wow, here you are. I wouldn't have flown to Thailand to have this conversation, but because of COVID, here we are globally having these conversations. So there's a lot of silver lining. That's right. From COVID. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for having me. Really, thank you for believing that there was value in what I had to share. And hopefully your listeners will feel inspired through some hopeful conversation. I'm sure about that. Thank you so much again, patients. Lightmates, if you like this and you learn a lot from this episode, please download, share, subscribe, especially to your families and friends because I'm sure they too will learn from this episode. Happy New Year again to everyone and to our special guest. Sending love and hugs to patients in the U.S. Thank you so much, patients. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arnie. You're doing great work in this world. 